During this time, I was working as a game warden in the state of Indiana. The income that I received from this job was determined by the arrests I made. But I never did make any arrests. Instead, I'd sit down and talk to the violators about sportsmanship, which I felt produced a greater return than the fines I could have imposed. In the meanwhile, our little girl had come on the scene. Little Sharon Rose. Bless her sweet little heart. She's in heaven today. She was a darling to me. I just love little children, and I remember how happy we were together. I wanted to call her a Bible name. I couldn't call her the Rose of Sharon after Jesus, so I called her Sharon Rose. We lived in a little old house. I remember I used to come home in the evenings and she'd be sitting out there in the yard with her little four corners on. And as I came around the corner, I would touch the siren on the car that I used as a game warden. She'd know that I was coming and she'd say, Goo goo goo. Then she'd hold her little old arms out and I would get her and hug her. My, she was just as sweet as she could be. Soon my wife took sick with a lung infection. Next my brother was killed right nearby me. See, the way of a transgressor is hard. Then my father, at age 52, had a heart attack one night and died in my arms an hour later. Just a few days before he died, he was in a saloon and someone asked him to take a drink. He took the glass but started to shake. Setting it down, he started to cry and talked about his son who was preaching. He went on to say that all these years he had been wrong and his son was right. He said, Because I am a drunkard, don't let it reflect on my boys. This is the last drink I'll ever take in all my life. Then he picked up the glass and tried to drink the contents but spilled it all over his face. Again he cried, picked up his hat and walked out. This incident was relayed to me by an insurance agent whom I later led to the Lord. Shortly before his death, he had given his heart to the Lord. God was still speaking to my heart. Then my sister-in-law died right there in her home. Everything didn't seem to be going right at my church either. The way of a transgressor is hard. See, I kept going down then. But when I failed, I believed that God still protected his gift. Then I said, Oh, what can I do? I've made a mistake. The anointing of God had left me, and it never really returned until the angel met me in 1946. These years were the dark period of my life. All this was the result of not doing what I knew God wanted me to do. After a while, my wife got pneumonia. The 1937 flood came up suddenly and she was caught in it. I remember that night. I shall never forget it. The dike broke through up there and the city was being swept off the map. I took Hope and both babies up to a temporary hospital set up by the government. There they were all up there very sick. Hope had a temperature of 105 degrees. When I had gone to pray that evening, she had taken sick. I looked up and said, Lord, have mercy on my wife and heal her, will you, Lord? Because I love her. It looked like I saw something falling like a black sheet and it came right down like that. I just knew then that something was going to happen. I went and told my church people. They said that it was because I was so concerned and sympathetic, being it was my wife. I said, no, there is a black curtain that has come between God and me. Something has separated me from him and he doesn't hear me. Oh, I was weary. The night when the flood broke through, I was on a patrol squad on the river. I was rescuing people everywhere, hauling them, piling them out like cattle. I was called then and told to come down to a place where the flood broke through on the other side. I ran down there real quick. I could hear people crying. I heard a woman screaming, Help! Help! I thought of what I could do and then ran and got the speedboat. I started up but I couldn't buck those waves. The dike had broken through and those two-story houses were just shaken on their foundations. Although I tried to go against those waves, I couldn't make it. Finally, I went one way and was swept down so I could get a rope around the post of the porch when I went by. I tied the boat and left the motor running to hold it against the waves. 
I ran into the house and found three or four little children, picked them up and got them in the boat. Then I got the mother, packed her in the boat and started out. It was about one o'clock in the morning, snowing and sleeting, as I jumped in the boat and started back. Just as I got over to the land where a group of people were waiting to catch the boat as we came by, the woman started crying. My baby! My baby! I thought she had left her baby behind, and so leaving them there, I went back again. Part of the house had already gone when I finally reached it. I ran in and looked all around without finding anyone. Later I came to find out the baby was about two years old. I thought she had a little baby in there. Then as I heard the side of the house go out, I ran and jumped out of the window and landed on top of the porch. When I did, I saw my boat leaving. I grabbed hold of the rope and got in the boat as wet as I could be. I tried to start it, but there was ice all over the starter string. I just pulled and pulled, but it wouldn't start. The current caught me out in the river and the boat was just about to capsize. I couldn't get the motor started. I had a sick wife and two sick children in the hospital. I had just buried my daddy a few weeks before that. And there I was. I knelt in the boat and said, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I know I've done wrong, but please, dear God, don't let me have to leave my wife and babies and be drowned in this river. I pulled again and again. There I was, going right straight for the falls. I pulled the string, but it wouldn't start. I prayed again and said, God, have mercy. I had time to think a lot of things over, friends. I tell you, when that hour comes and death is pushing right up against you, you'll think a lot of things that you are not thinking about now. I pulled and I pulled, and by God's grace, the motor started. I went back and bucked the waves again and came out way down in Howard's Park, down below Jeffersonville, about three o'clock in the morning. Then they told me the other side of the dike had broken and come down through Lanky Kank Creek and cut off the government depot. I went up there real quick and found the waters had reached the temporary hospital. I met a captain standing there and said, Captain, sir, did anybody get drowned? He said, No, there was nobody drowned. I said, I had a wife and two sick children in there. He said, Well, I think everybody got out as far as I know. I went on a little farther and I met my associate pastor. He threw his arms around me and hugged me as he said, Billy boy, if I never see you again, I'll see you in the morning. That was the last time I saw him. He was killed during the time of the flood. Later, I met Major Weekly, who said, Reverend Branham, your wife and the babies went out on a cattle car towards Charlestown, Indiana. It was sleeting and hailing as I ran to get my boat and start up there where Lanky Kang Creek comes through. Somebody said, Oh, that cattle car was washed off the track up there and everyone in it was drowned. Oh my. Then somebody said, No, it wasn't. It went through. We heard a dispatch that it went through. Well, I got in my boat and started over there. I saw that current coming through. I couldn't pierce that water. It trapped me and there I was marooned in a place called Port Fulton for about seven days. Then I had time to think it all over. Then I prayed. I cried and wondered if my wife was dead or alive. How were my children? My mother? Finally, when the water was down I got across and started walking. I was going up the road and I met an old friend of mine, Mr. Hay, from Charlestown. I asked, is my wife there? He said, No, Billy. Mrs. Branham is not there, but we'll find her somewhere. I said, There was a train coming through with a cattle car full of sick people. He said, It never stopped there. I went down to the dispatcher's office. He said, Oh, the engineer that took that cattle car will be here in just a few minutes. He was here a while ago. When he returned, he told me, Yes, sir. I remember a sick mother and two children. I left them off at Columbus, Indiana. They were very sick. That was about seven or eight days before, and I wondered if they were still alive. I had no way of getting around, so I just started walking up the road. 
As I was going along there crying, a car came up to me. In it was a friend of mine who said, Bo, I know what you're looking for. You're looking for hope, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, well, she's laying by the side of my wife at the Baptist Temporary Hospital in Columbus, Indiana, with tuberculosis near death. He said, I don't know where your babies are. I never saw them, but I saw Mrs. Branham there. You won't know her when you see her. She lost at least 25 pounds of weight. She thinks you're dead. Oh my, friends. When I think about that, something just boils in my heart. I got in the car and finally got to the Baptist church which was used as an emergency hospital. I ran in. The place was crowded. I shouted, Hope! Hope! Just as loudly as I could. I looked over at an old cot in the corner and I saw a little bony hand raised up waving at me. It was she. Her face was very thin and I ran to her quickly and fell down at her side crying. Oh my, she was almost gone. Her dark eyes, expressing the intense suffering she had gone through, looked up at me as I took her pale, thin hand in mine and prayed the best I knew how. But seemingly it was to no avail. There was no answer. Then I felt her hand touch me on the back. It was a doctor who said, Are you Reverend Branham? I said, Yes, sir. He said, Could I speak to you a minute? And I said, Yes, sir. I walked over to one side and he said, Aren't you a personal friend of Dr. Sam Adair in Jeffersonville? I said, We have lived together, fished together, slept together. We are just very good friends. He said, Well, I want to tell you, your wife is dying. Brother Branham. I said, No, doctor, God won't let her die. Well, he said, as far as medical aid is concerned, she is finished. She has galloping tuberculosis, and I don't think anything can stop it now that it has gotten a hold of her. Are my babies all right? I asked. He said, They're in another room. The reason they won't let them around her is because she's got tuberculosis. One of your babies is pretty good, but the other one is very sick. Will you take me to them, doctor? I asked. I went over there to see my poor little Billy and Sharon laying there. I looked at them and then went back to where Hope was. Honey, I said, you'll be all right. You'll be able to come home and everything will be okay. I cried and begged God with all my heart. I did everything that I knew how to do. Dr. Adair, bless his heart, worked as faithfully as any man could work. We sent to Louisville for a specialist to come over, a Dr. Miller from the sanatorium. He came into the room that day, checked her over and advised certain treatments. Dr. Adair told him, that's what she's getting and that's all we can do. And I said, doctor, isn't there any hope at all? He said, no hope at all, sir. Unless God has mercy. I presume that she's a Christian and you are a Christian. I said, yes, sir. She's ready to go. But doctor, I love her. Isn't this something you can do? He said, Reverend Branham, my hands are tied. We've done everything that we know to do for tuberculosis. I said, oh my. I looked at her and thought, oh, what can I do? I said to her, I think you're going to be all right, don't you? She said, I don't know, dear. It doesn't matter. Only thing I hate to leave you and the children. I said, well, honey, I believe you'll be all right. She said, I want to talk to you just a minute, honey. I said, yes. She said, did that doctor tell you anything? I said, don't ask me, sweetheart. I've got to go to work now, but I'll come back every few hours. I would look at her and pray and cry and beg and plead. It looked like the heavens were brass before me. I just couldn't get anywhere.